One final thought. A group of Jews were sitting around a fire one evening in the home of the Magid. The Magid wasn't feeling well, and they decided to stay the night to take care of him. They thought he was sleeping, so they got into a conversation. These were very simple Jews who had barely made it through Cheder and could just about read Hebrew, but nothing more. What was their conversation or their discussion? One of them said, you know, I really don't understand. I'm ashamed to say, I don't understand why we make a big deal about our father Abraham. Our father Avraham, God came to him and said, sacrifice your son, and, and he was willing to sacrifice his son. What's the big deal? If God came to me, me, Yassel, nobody, and said that I should sacrifice my son, wouldn't I also do it? What's the big deal? If God talks to you, you listen. And they thought about it for a while, and they all agreed that it was a good question, because they would all do it, if God said. So one of them said, I think the greatness of Avraham was not that he was willing, but that he did it with joy. And they all gave that a little thought. And then one of them said, I don't, I don't think that that's good enough of an explanation, because if God came to me and said to me, sacrifice your son, I would do it with joy. After all, when God speaks to you, it's a whole different... And they thought about it, and they all agreed that they would all do it with joy. So what was Abraham's greatness? Finally, one of them said, the greatness of Abraham was that earlier God had said to him, from your son Yitzhak you will have many grandchildren. It will be a great nation, a unique people. And here Yitzhak wasn't even married yet, and God says sacrifice him. The greatness of Avraham was that he didn't hesitate. He didn't get confused. He didn't say, but, but wait a minute. But wait a minute. Didn't you say that I was going to have grandchildren with Yitzhak? So, of course, there was no selfish reaction on the part of Avraham. When God speaks to you, you kind of put aside all your selfishness. But, but the fact that God was contradicting himself, shouldn't that have kind of confused him or, or made him hesitate for a moment? And it didn't. And that was his greatness. And they agreed that, that was, that's a good explanation. That if it happened to them, that God told them one thing one day, something else the next day, they, they would have had a little bit of a catch. The Magid heard all this. He was very pleased with the simplicity and the sincerity and the honesty of these of the, this conversation. But when he repeated the story, he said, the true explanation is the greatness of Avraham is that he was the first one. Once Avraham experienced the willingness and the ability to sacrifice what is most precious, your own child, once he experienced that, after him, it came easily to everyone else. So the question that these people were asking, what's so great about Avraham, I would do it too, the question is not a good question. Now you would do it too. But if you had to be the first one, you could not do it. So there's this idea that when something happens, it creates an opening. It creates a gate through which everyone else can now go easily. But who opened that gate? Who broke through? Who made that possible? The first one. And that's why Avraham was great, because he pioneered self-sacrifice. Now we just follow in his footsteps, it's so much easier. Once a human being experienced that feeling, then his children and children's children, for all generations to come, can now experience it much more easily. 
because it's already in the program. So the story of a people is really the program of the people. What our grandparents experienced, we now have as an inheritance. They pioneered, we simply follow. It's already in the blood, so to speak. And that's why these stories are not just concepts, ideas, lofty principles. They tell you it's been done, and therefore you can do it readily. It's in your history, it's therefore in your blood. And if it's in your blood, you have the ability. All you need to do is act on it. That's why a Jew is born Jewish. Because the experience of that relationship with God that was unique between Avraham and God, every one of his children inherits it. In potential. And then our job is to put it to good use. We've got a rich inheritance. We just have to use it right. Invest it well. So that's the story of the Exodus that we have to repeat to our children the whole mitzvah of the Seder night to tell the children, keep them awake, don't let them fall asleep, do weird things to get them curious so that they'll ask questions, so that they'll listen when you answer. What is all that for? Not to tell us what happened to our ancestors, to tell us what we are capable of. If you know, when you know, that your ancestors were enslaved in a very uh, oppressive and very difficult slavery for 210 years, and then God took, took us out of there, and we were liberated from that, that tells you that whatever slavery you're in today, don't be impressed. We've done that. We've been there. It's in our blood to walk away from slavery. That's why we tell the story. So that we walk out of Egypt. Not just remember that someone else did. There's a law in, in the laws of Purim that if you read the Megillah, um, but change the order of the chapters. If you start from the end and read backwards, or you read the last chapter first, or you, re you reverse the order, which means you read it backwards, then you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah. The Baal Shem Tov came along and said, that doesn't mean only a literal backward reading. It means that if you read the story and you think of it as backwards, in other words, you think of it as something that happened a long time ago, then you haven't done the mitzvah. Because when we tell a story, we're not talking about what once happened. Every story, when it's told, is a story about what is happening. So if you read the Megillah as an ancient document, you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah. As we read the, the story of Esther, the Megillah of Esther, we are reading our own story, what we are going through, what we are capable of, what's in our program, not something that happened a long time ago. So that's the story of stories. Hasidic stories have a number of conditions to them. Number one, Hasidic stories are true stories. There's no fiction. Um, actually, I, sh I should correct that. In Chabad uh, stories, there's very little fiction. Very little, um, uh, what do they call, fables or... Chabad stories are well-documented stories. Stories about either a Rebbe or a Chassid. Preferably a Chassid. Because uh, we're not programmed to be Debus, we're programmed to be Hasidim. <clears throat> the story has to be true. Number two, the story has to be told correctly. 
no embellishments, no uh, no hype. The story has to be um, a story with a moral, with a lesson, and the story has to be um, like a like a jewel housed in its proper setting. You have to have an occasion for a story. There are occasions for stories. Um, because the setting of the story is as important as the story itself. The setting for the diamond is as important as the diamond itself, in terms of looks, not in terms of cost. So let me tell you a little story. The previous Rebbe, when he was a little boy, uh, was a very good student. And he took to his lessons very well. One day he was reviewing his lesson, had a very quick mind, and his father walked by. And his father said to him, it says in the Shema, Va'avadetem mehera me'al ha'oretz ha'toyva. In the second chapter of the Shema, it says that if you don't follow God's commandments, then you will quickly be lost from the good land that God gave you. His father changed the meaning. He said, Ve'avadetem meheva. You will quickly be lost. He translated it, Lose your quickness. Get rid of this hurry from the good will that God has blessed you with. Because the word Eretz can also mean Ratzon. So his father said to him, get rid, lose this haste that you have in the good will that God blessed you with. You like to learn, you enjoy learning, but stop this rush, slow down. Previous Rebbe writes in his diary that that changed his entire study habits. From then on, he, he he was different. And there were many such stories in his diary that uh, that he describes and says this made a lasting impression on me, and this was changed my life, and this changed my feeling. What what seems like a one-liner on the part of his father had this incredible impact on him. Now, granted, they had a very unique relationship. This was a Rebbe whose, whose child was destined to be the next Rebbe. I mean, you were talking about people of a different league. So that everything his father said to him, he took seriously. All right, this, it was a different kind of relationship. But still. So I once asked one of my teachers, why did it have such an effect? I try one-liners on my kids. <laughs> it doesn't... It doesn't have. They look at me and say, "All right," and then they just go back to what they were before. And it doesn't have any. And that's when my teacher explained to me, his father didn't just happen to walk by, and hear him studying quickly, and threw out this one liner. It wasn't that way at all. His father had been thinking about his son's learning habits for a long time. He noticed the haste. A long time ago. But he waited for the right moment. He waited until he had a way of presenting the idea in a... Um, how do we put this? In, um, in a way that goes down easy. In a memorable way. In a painless way. But in a telling way. And it's because he waited... It's because he chose the setting, he chose the moment, and he chose the phrase, that's why it had that kind of an impact. But when you throw out one-liners, you don't, you don't get that kind of result. So a reflex statement, a reflex reaction, doesn't produce great results. A thoughtful response, when you take your time, when you pick the setting, and you pick your words, and you pick the message. There could have been other things his father could have said to him. 
you know, a kid growing up needs to hear a lot of things about many subjects. Where do you start? Where do you begin? Should you tell him not to hurry in his studies? Should you tell him to wake up on time? Should you tell him to be re- respectful to his teacher? Should you tell him to give more charity? I mean, what? Where do you begin? You have to know what the child is ready to hear. You have to know when he's ready to hear it and how he's ready to hear it. And if you're correct in all three, it will have very telling results. Anybody want to say anything? (laughs) Hmm? Huh? But one of the things we try to do is not tell them that we're telling them a story. In other words, we don't say, uh, come on, sit down, I'm going to tell you a story. The story just fits into the conversation and fits into the event naturally. And then later they'll think and say, oh, that was a good story. But nobody said it was a story. It's what happened. It's not a story, it's what happened. Of course, everything that happened is a story. So we don't sit down and say, okay, let me tell you a story. Except maybe on on special occasions. But generally, the story just fits in, you know, slides into the conversation naturally, or as naturally as you can make it. So that, so that they're not conscious of the fact that they're hearing a story. Somebody once came to visit a, a family in uh, Brooklyn, and this was the first time they had, they had spent Shabbos with, a, with an observant family. And one, of, she writes, she writes a book about it. And one of the things that struck her, that really caught her off guard, is that they were sitting around the table talking about this guy David and uh, Moshe, and she was trying to follow the conversation, and she just couldn't figure out, what, who are these people, and wh- when did they, where were they going, what were they doing? I thought she really they're talking about Moshe Rabbeinu and King David. But but for the longest time, it sounded they were talking about a cousin. You know, like, he came, he said, but he didn't, he thought, he meant, you don't understand, that's not what he wanted, as if they were members of the family that had visited last week or something. And nobody said, well, this is the story of King David. It was David. David said. David was upset. No, that's not what he said. He said something. And, and it just fits. It's just part of, part of everyday life. So now, <clears throat> let me tell you a story. <laughs> this is really a story. It's a true story, and it's very, very much, a very, integral part of the history of Lubavitch. The history of Lubavitch is basically the history of Judaism under under Stalin. Of uh, Judaism under communism. The first Lubavitch school had hundreds of students. Three quarters of those students did not survive communism. They were hounded, they were oppressed, they were exiled, they were killed. As we go through a list of the original students of the yeshiva in Lubavitch, at the end of every biography, died in a con- died in a labor camp, disappeared, was never heard from again, shot by firing squad. How did, how did anybody, how did the community survive? Seems like everybody somehow got killed. But a few did survive. One of those who survived writes in his diary uh, a little episode which makes a great story. He was exiled for 22 years. 22 years. 
they moved him from prison camp to labor camp to prison cell to exiled communities to to barren frozen tundras 22 years his name was laser he passed away last year at the age of 98 this laser was one of the early students of the yeshiva and in the 20s when communism uh, was determined to destroy all of Judaism in Russia the previous Rebbe called ten of his students into a meeting and made them swear that they would die preserving Judaism the ten of them promised that they would do that and then went about organizing schools, mikvahs, Jewish services, a bris, a mail, a shaykhat, whatever it was that was necessary to keep Judaism alive. Over the years, they were caught one by one and they paid with their life. Two of them survived. Laser was one of them. In the many years of exile that he experienced, there was one year when he was shipped to a place, a God-forsaken village, where he was in transit to his final, uh, to his final punishment. In the meantime, he was put into a cell in this village. Wherever he came throughout the 22 years, he never worked on Shabbos, even in labor camps. He didn't work on Shabbos. It helped a lot that he was trained as a bookkeeper, and wherever he came, they immediately gave him the job of keeping the books. As a bookkeeper, he was able to lock himself in his office on Shabbos and spend the whole day davening and then make up some work on Saturday night or do some extra work Friday. And that way he was able to observe Shabbos the entire 22 years that he was in their clutches. There were times that it was not so easy. There were times when the Nachalnik, the officer in charge of the labor camp, was determined to force him to work on Shabbos and wouldn't look away. What happened one time in a labor camp is that a new Nachalnik took over the camp and unlike the older man who had turned a blind eye to the fact that Laser would never work on Shabbos, this younger guy was determined to break him. And he threatened him that he wants the door open and he wants to see him working on Shabbos. Laser said, I'm not going to do that. He said, then you will not survive the weekend. And Laser, having nothing else to say and nothing more to lose, said, I will see who doesn't survive the weekend. All the people in the office heard this exchange. Well, it seems that this new Nachalnik had gotten on everybody's nerves and everybody hated him. That Friday night, he went out of, he left the camp to go into town to, uh, to have a few drinks. Early Shabbos morning, he was coming back very drunk. And as he approached the camp, the guard in the watchtower asked, identify yourself. But this was his camp. He wasn't going to identify himself. He was the Nachalnik of the camp. He said, open the gate. And they said, you have to identify yourself. They knew who it was. They didn't like him. But he was drunk and arrogant and he wouldn't, he wouldn't identify himself. Regulations in the prison was that if somebody approaches the prison and refuses to identify himself or can't, can't identify himself, you fire a warning, two warning shots in the air and if he doesn't respond, you shoot him. Well, they shot 
twice into him. And then one warning shot. Word got around that he hadn't survived the weekend. And that this, uh, this, uh, Shabbos observer had said, we'll see who doesn't survive the weekend. After that, nobody ever bothered him again. In fact, they gave him a nickname, Subota, which means Saturday. They called him Saturday. In America, some people are called Friday. Him they called Saturday. But that's not the story I meant to tell. This man came to this village where he was put into prison. And he did what he did at every prison. He asked to read the bylaws, the rules and regulations which took all the prison officials by surprise because no one ever asked for that. He asked to see the laws. He read them, all the fine print, and started to demand his rights. See, on paper, communism sounds very good. So he started to demand his rights, which drove them absolutely crazy. In this particular prison, they asked him to sign. They brought him a paper, sign this. He said, what is it? They said, it's uh, a permission slip to send all your baggage home. You're traveling from village to village, schlepping all the stuff with you. Send it home until you know your final destination. Then we'll forward it there. And they said, your wife already agreed. All you need to do is sign. He said, my wife agreed? When did you speak to my wife? They said, oh, she's she's here. She's uh, she's She's here in the village, and we spoke to her. He says, in that case, I want to visit with him. He said, no, prisoners are not allowed to visit. He whips out the laws and he says, well, according to this, prisoner in transit is allowed to visit with his family. Made him crazy. The prison official had to admit that his wife had never been there, had never agreed to anything. And he refused to sign it because they were simply going to confiscate all his stuff. He got on this prison official's nerves. He was so difficult that the prison official did something very unusual. He threw him out. He said, get out of my prison. I don't want you here. You're a pain in the neck. Go find some place to live and don't leave town. So he finds himself walking around town looking for a place to live he hears that there is a Tartar, a Muslim, who is renting a room. He goes and he knocks on his door and he asks if he has a room to rent. The Tartar gives him a very funny look. Strange little smile. And says, yes, I happen to have a room to rent. But, you have to share it. Somebody already lives there. It's big enough for two, but you're going to have to share. Not having much of a choice, he went to the room. The tartar walks him around to the back of the house where the apartment was and lets him into the apartment. He walks into the apartment and the other guy renting the room is a guy named Mayer. Another yeshiva student a little bit younger than Laser, who had been exiled into this village for ten years. That was his final destination. Well, now he understood that funny look that he got from the Tartar and that funny smile. They were thrilled. Old friends from Yeshiva in this God-forsaken village are now sharing an apartment. They were thrilled with each other. This was not long before Sukkot. When Laser rented the apartment from this tartar, the prison official who lived across the road came to the to the Muslim, to the tartar, and warned him that he was going to get into a lot of trouble renting to these Zionists. The tartar, Muslims were not afraid of the communists. The Muslims said, 
They're not Zionists. What are you paranoid about? They're just two private individuals. The prison official said, no, you're going to see. They're going to organize meetings. There's going to be clandestine affairs going on. And as soon as you're going to be, you're going to, you're going to be responsible. You're going to get in trouble for this. It's going to be terrible. I'm warning you as a friend. Get them out of there. Throw them out. One of the reasons he was so upset is because he had just thrown Laser out of the prison and Laser rented an apartment nicer than his. What made it nicer than his? It had a wooden floor. The prison official's house didn't have a wooden floor. And we're talking village life here. So he was jealous. The Muslim said to him, God, leave me alone. Well, stop with your paranoia. They don't have meetings and they're not Zionists and they're just... He says, all right, I warned you, you'll see. You'll see. Laser went out to look for work. He was a bookkeeper. Came back in the evening and he sees that Mayer had built a sukkah in the back of the house. Laser was the more cautious of the two. Mayer was kind of the younger, braver. Well, that was very nice, a sukkah. Why not? But sukkah's night. Mayer was sitting in the sukkah. And he ha somehow had managed to find a bottle of vodka, which was never in short supply. And he said a few Lachayims and invited Laser to say a few Lachayims. And Laser said, you know, let's, let's not be reckless here. You know, the prison official is right across the street. He's looking for an excuse to do us in. Don't, don't, don't get carried away. Mayor said, it's Yantif. Say L'chaim, let's sing a few songs. What's the matter? What's the problem? Laser finally convinced him that it was not the prudent thing to do. The second night of Yantif, Laser walks into the sukkah, and the bottle is half empty. And Mayer is singing a song to himself, and he's saying L'chaim to himself. Laser says, what are you doing? Mayer says, well, you won't for bring with me, I'm for bringing by myself. Laser says, don't be reckless. Mayor said to him, I'm surprised at you. I'm disappointed in you. You're afraid of them? They're nothing. They're nothing. They're fallen leaves. Why are you afraid of them? They're meaningless. They're fake. They're false. Unholiness is untrue. It's yamtiv. What's the matter with you? Come say l'chaim. Let's celebrate. It's yamtiv. And at that point, Laser remembered when the previous Rebbe called him into the room and made him take a vow that he would die preserving Yiddishkeit. And he thought to himself, I wasn't afraid then when I promised to do that. I wasn't afraid. Why am I afraid now? And he said, Mayor, you're right. Give me the bottle. They shared the bottle, they said a few Lachayims or whatever was left, and they got up to dance, singing at the top of their lungs. They have their eyes closed with an arm over each other's shoulder, and they're singing and they're dancing, it's Yumpin, in the sukkah. The prison official comes running across the street, storms into the Muslim's house, and he says, you see? Now you're in trouble. I warned you. I told you they would have been having meetings back there. The Zionist uh, plot that they have. And the Muslim says, oh, cut it out. There's no meeting. It's just the two of them. The prison official says, what do you mean the two of them? Listen to that tumult. Listen to what's going on over there. He says, it's just the two of them. He says, I don't believe you. That can't be. The Muslim says, come, I'll show you. They walk around to the back of the house, and there's this rickety little sukkah put together of a few boards, and they peek in, and the prison official can't believe what he sees. These guys are dancing and singing, and, and they're shining with joy. So he says to the Muslim, what are they doing? He says, they're celebrating. He says, what do they have to celebrate? 
They're my prisoners. The Muslim says, you communists are so ignorant. You don't understand anything. Don't you know that these are holy men? And when they have a holy day, they couldn't care less about your guns and your dogs and your guards and your prisons. The prison official says, really? Holy men? He had never seen holy men. <clears throat> he says, come, let's, let's, let's wish them good wishes for their holiday. So the Muslim says, if you want them to have a good holiday, go home. <laughs> the next morning, the landlord told his two tenants what had happened. And he said, look, I saved you that time, but don't push your luck. I don't know if I can do this a second time. A few weeks later, Laser was sent for another ten years to Siberia. That was his final destination. And so Mayer was once again alone in this God-forsaken village. The Muslim had a grandson who had turned 13 and it was time to do a circumcision. So they make a big party and they invite all their friends and they partied late into the night. When everybody had left, the prison official says to the Muslim, have maybe another drink. Get me another drink. I will tell you an incredible story. Life is so strange. So, breaks out another bottle. They say another, they share another drink. And the prison official tells the Muslim this story. He says, do you know that I have a new job? I was given a new job. A couple of weeks ago, the governor of the, of the vicinity of the gubernia made a comment about Stalin that he had overreacted in something. And the KGB immediately killed him. The governor. It seems the governor's brother-in-law had been executed. And the governor said it wasn't so necessary. So he was executed. Well, now there's a problem. Every uh, sentence that was passed on a, on a prisoner had to be signed by three people, three signatures. The local prosecutor, the local head of the KGB, and the governor. Well, now there's no governor. So they're missing a signature, a signature, on the uh, verdict, on the uh, final whatever. So they came to me, he says. I should be the third one to sign on these papers until they get a new governor. So you see, all of a sudden I have a new job. I come into the office in the morning, the secretary puts down a stack of papers I have to sign. You know, after a night of drinking, I can't see straight. So I don't know what I'm signing. She tells me where to sign, I sign. But the other day, I came to the office completely sober. Didn't have a drink the night before. Couldn't find a drink. And I was in a foul mood. I came into the office. Secretary put down a stack of papers. Says sign. I take a look at the first paper. And it's about the Jinji, the redhead you had living in the back by you, laser. It said, verdict, firing squad. And I thought to myself, shoot a holy man like a dog? That's not right. So I tore it up, took out a blank, filled it in with all the information, and I was writing 10 years katorga, 10 years hard labor. As I'm doing this, the head of the KGB walks in. 
And he says to me, what are you doing? I said, well, this guy, uh, firing squad, uh, that's not right. The KGB man was livid. It's not your job to decide. You just have to sign. Who gives you permission to change the verdict or to change? He says, well, I just felt it was like a holy man to be shot like a dog. He says, holy man, he's a Zionist. So the prison official says, don't be silly. He's not a Zionist. (laughs) He lived right across the street from me. There were never any meetings. There was nothing. It was just the two of them. So the KGB man says, but he writes to Schneerson. So the prison official said, well, for that he deserves 10 years. 10 years of, of labor. Anyway, the KGB man screamed at him some more and said, don't ever do this again. The next day, Laser was sent away for 10 years hard labor. So this prison official, this Kozak, is saying to the Muslim, isn't it strange how the world, how life goes? If I hadn't come across the street that night like a Meshuggah when they were singing there, and if I hadn't been convinced that they were having a meeting, and you hadn't explained to me that those were holy people, he would be dead now. Isn't that strange? The Muslim, the next morning, told that whole story to Laser, to Mayor. Amazing story. The way that God runs the world and the strange uh, evolution of events and so on. Twenty years later, 1968, Laser was allowed to leave Russia. Came to New York for Sukkot to be with the Rebbe. Walked into the shul the first night of Sukkot and bumped into Mayer, who had gotten out of Russia much earlier and had lived in Detroit for many years. And had also come for Sukkot to be with the Rebbe. Mayor said to Lazar, Come to my Sukkot, we'll say Lachayim, and I will tell you a story you won't believe. He says, Really? About whom? He says, About you. <laughs> and he told him the story. So it turned out that in fact, when Mayor had said to Lazar, don't be afraid of them. It's Sukkot. We have to celebrate Sukkot. We have to do what is true and what is right. There is no reason to be afraid. Turned out, that's what saved me. So Laser tells Mayor a story. He says, remember I had trouble with my leg? I had terrible pains in his legs. And all the doctors in these labor camps and prisons who examined him, all kept saying, amputation. He refused. They kept telling him, you're going to die if you don't amputate. He refused. And what gave him the strength to refuse? The last time he saw the devil. <clears throat> Before they arrested him, the last time he saw the devil, the devil said to him, we should come together again in joy. Come together. To come together, you need feet. So if the Rebbe said, we're going to come together again, I knew that I should not amputate my leg. And that they were, they were, they were not telling me the truth, and it was just part of their... And in fact, to his very last day, Laser's leg gave him trouble, but never had an amputation. He passed away last year in Israel. <laughs> Even a communist isn't always wrong. <laughs> it's a good sukkah story. 
So, what's your evaluation? There's one other thing about, about storage off, off the record. Obvi it's obvious from Torah that the stories, even when they're told to children, are not cleaned up. There's no cleaning up a story. Even when talking to children, you don't hesitate to say so-and-so died, so-and-so killed, so-and-so. If that's the story, that's the way you tell it. Um, what was his name? Uh, Bruno Bettelheim uh, says that all the fairy tales, classical fairy tales, have a lot of violence in them. And in modern times, people feel that they should clean up the story. Uh, the, the, the woodsman that came and saved Little Red Riding Hood didn't kill the wolf. He just chased him away. Clean it up a little bit. Now, take out the violence. Uh, Bethlehem wrote, writes that, that that ruins the whole effect of the story because every fairy tale had a subliminal message. And it was meant to convey concepts that you couldn't talk to a child about consciously, openly. And so they were, these messages were couched in the form of the story. And if the woodsman doesn't kill the wolf, you've destroyed the whole story. Because the whole point of the story is that when you grow up and you outgrow the wolf, the wolf is dead forevermore. He's not going to come back again after the woodsman leaves. So the wolf represents a certain evil, whatever, and if you don't tell the story where the wolf is dead, not to be worried about again, then, you, then you've then you ruined the effect of the story. I don't know what, uh, what the Torah's subliminal messages are, but it's very clear that Torah does not hesitate to, uh, to give very graphic adult themes to stories. And it should not be cleaned up. So in, in the stories of, of Jewish martyrdom, we don't, we don't soften. Of course, you don't dwell on gruesome details, but, but you don't avoid them either. You tell it the way it, the way it was.